We are now recording. All right, thank you. Um, now that we've completed the first half of the documentary series, the first three episodes, um, we in particular have a good, very, very high level view of the first millennium, the first thousand years, especially of Christianity and the shape and the form that it took. Um, there are a couple things I wanted to, to mention and then we'll dive into questions and thoughts and reactions. One thing that's just a personal thing that I have, and you'll see this if you open any book in history discussing it or anything else, but it's a particular point that if you haven't done that, you may not have run into. Um, the term Byzantine Empire is not one that was ever used during the entire tenure of that empire. Um, if you asked, I mean, I showed you in the first one, the, the map of under Constantine, the Roman Empire, uh, some of those parts, the frontiers and some of the contested lands were lost, were overrun by barbarians or like Britannia just picked up and abandoned because it was too difficult to supply and not worth the effort. Um, the Italian peninsula is what was primarily lost in some other areas that were really core to the empire. And that's what Justinian, as you saw in the map they showed, took back. Uh, but the rest of the empire, that whole other expanse of the Mediterranean was still there. <laughs> and they called it the Roman Empire. Um, if you asked anyone who was a citizen what they were a citizen of, they would have said the Roman Empire, you know, I'm a citizen of Rome. Uh, if you asked even people who weren't citizens, you know, it, uh, who was ruled their lands, they'd say Rome. You know, if you ask their enemies, Persia, um, you know, the Islam, as when Islam developed and grew and encroached and took land, who they were, who their enemy was, it, it was Rome. <laughs> uh, that's, what it was always called, um, and, and even into the early 20th century in the Ottoman Empire, the name for the conquered people, um, and I don't speak Turkish, but it's something like Meliti, which means uh, Roman nation, uh, <laughs> up to the early 20th century. Uh, the earliest occurrence of the uh, Byzantine Empire is uh, from a German historian in 1557, long after the Roman Empire was conquered. Uh, but it still wasn't used very much. Uh, it would show up sometimes in, in art and poetry and uh, things like that. Uh, and Byzantine comes from Byzantium. And Byzantium was the name of the village uh, on which Constantine founded Constantinople. Uh, that's where the name comes from. It did not become widely used until the mid-19th century. And I've always found that timing interesting because what was, ha what was the mid-19th century? That was the height of the global Western European empire, uh, colonialism. And they wanted to establish a history, a tie to the Roman Empire uh, that really was never centered in Western Europe. Uh, Western Europe was the barbarians, the frontier uh, during the Roman Empire days. And so they renamed the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. It's just a, a point. There is no such thing as a neutral history. A history is told for a reason. Uh, it's written for a reason, it's from a perspective, and sometimes you need to ask, why is it told this way? Um, now, it is very interesting the way Christianity developed, and I don't know if that was clear in these three episodes because you just can't cover the whole scope of it, but Christianity always developed uh, independent churches that had different liturgies in the area they were in, that adopted practices in the area they were in. Uh, that was its very ancient model. Um, you know, some of the ancient patriarchs they've discussed, you know, uh, 
Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, uh, Constantinople after Constantinople was founded. Uh, there's also the Patriarch of Georgia, one of the early ones, um, or the, the Church of Georgia that became its own independent develop. Uh, the Kingdom of Armenia, uh, Edessa was a city-state. It was an independent city-state, but it was really just centered around the one city. Uh, the first kingdom that became Christian was Armenia uh, in 301 CE, and they had their own church. Um, and that's the practice that continued and developed and, and continued all through the development of history. And the reason I find that interesting is because that process where churches are in communion with each other but have their own governance and their own rule is exactly the model of the Anglican communion. Uh, <laughs> you have 46 independently governed and, and administered churches, but you're in communion with each other. And that is this ancient Christian practice. Uh, that is the way it worked. And, um, you know, in the world today, you know, the Catholic Church, which did not continue that process as it split with the East. Um, instead, it kept everyone under one patriarchy. Uh, one of the titles of the, of, of the poem was Patriarch of the West. Uh, and, but, but, as they developed, you know, past that first thousand years, and as they went back into different lands, they kept everything under the same patriarchy. So they have a single head, um, but that's 1.3 billion today. The Orthodox churches, um, and, you know, they made it sound like there's one Eastern Orthodox church, and, and they're kind of, because they were focusing on the, uh, Greek Orthodox and it's and, and some of the patriarchs of it. Um, but there's actually uh, a bunch of them. Uh, you know, there's Constantinople, there's the Patriarch of Alexandria, of Antioch, of Jerusalem, of Moscow, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, Georgia, Church of Cyprus, Church of Greece, Church of Poland, Church of Albania. There's a Church of the Czech lands in Slovakia. Uh, and then there's some that some recognize and others don't, but there's uh, a bunch of them that are in communion with each other. And then churches that didn't agree with uh, Chalcedon, which they covered briefly, but I mean, they didn't mention one of the largest ones who, who is actually one of the three churches that have equal holdings in the Church of the Holy Sep Sepulchre, and that's the Church of Armenia. Uh, <laughs> it's it, with the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic, those three of them are, are basically governed uh, and, and have equal standing in the Church of the Holy Se Sepulchre. Uh, but there's also the Malakarian Syrian Orthodox Church, which more commonly is called the Indian Orthodox Church. There's uh, uh, the Ethiopian and Eritrean uh, Orthodox churches, and that they stem from the old kingdom of Ankrum uh, that, you know, is split and everything, but they're both Tawahado. Uh, and then there's the Coptic Church of Egypt, which Egypt kind of split in the third, in, in the fourth council in Chalcedon. Uh, there was the church that did not accept it, the bishops that did not accept it. And then there were ones that did, and they were called Melkite or Kingsmen. Uh, and so they're both an Orthodox Church of Alexandria and the Coptic Church of Egypt, uh, which both have their own patriarchs or Papa or Pope for the Coptic Church. Um, so the Orthodox Church, it, the churches that are all that are in communion or partially in communion, that's about 270 million people, Christians worldwide. The Oriental Orthodox churches are about 86 million. Uh, the Anglican communions around 85 million, 80, 90 million, somewhere in that range. Um, and those are the, you know, largest groups that have formal communion relationships and independent church relationships. Once you get in out from there, then you get, you know, into Lutheranism. Well, the problem is, is that all the different Lutheran synods are not really uh, in communion with each other. Uh, and, you know, you get into Methodism um, and, you know, and all the Wesleyan traditions, and there are a lot of them, but they're all over the place. And 
to count them and kind of count them together, but they don't really function in any sort of way together. And, and you know, Presbyterian have the same thing. Um, so at any rate, I just wanted to, to point out the connection between the way the ancient church is organized and the way the Anglican communion is organized, because I've always found it interesting, even though it's not clear that the Anglican communion, when it was established, had any real connection or knowledge because it of, of a lot of the ancient structures, but still fell into that. Same, and I don't know if there was or not, but there's not really any clear record of it, but still fell into that same pattern. Um, I just find that interesting. Um, so with that, and the other thing that I found really fascinating in, in all of these is because we talk about ecumenical councils and things like that, but these were never really dictated. There were lots of councils, if you read the records of the old one. Um, and there were even opposing councils, like the third ecumenical council in Ephesus, where they you know, denounced Nestorius. Well, there was an opposing one that the Patriarch of Antioch held uh, that affirmed Nestorius. Uh, and, and, you know, and these were, you know, major patriarchs at both ones. These are not, you know, everything. What always determined over time, if a council became considered ecumenical or a major council, was if the people accepted it. Um, you know, and you saw that in talks of Russia with, or, or other places where they would try to change iconic, you know, the iconoclasts, the iconoclasm. No, the people just outright refuse. No, we're not changing the way we're going to we worship. That is not our faith. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's what, you know, over whatever emperors wanted, whatever they tried to impose, no, the people wouldn't accept it. Um, so with that... Did anyone have anything in particular that stood out to them? Um, and if I don't see a raised hand, I'll invite someone. Lori has raised her hand. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like the about Cyril and Methodius because, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this in the Cornerstone. My daughter was in the Peace Corps in, Mass in what's now called the Republic of Northern <laughs> Macedonia, which used to be a part of, of uh, Yugoslavia, but the patron saints are Cyril and Methodosius. And there are statues of them in Okrid, which was one of the places they went, and, um, and things about them all over that area, which is where Sarah was. She was in Pashtani. But... Um, it was really interesting to see that and, and about the Cyrillic language. So it, um, because uh, her host family was very deeply in the Orthodox Church. So we got to see a lot of videos about their weddings and they talked a lot about their church and, and it was really cool to, to learn about it uh, firsthand with some people. So I like that a lot. And I'll go with that and be quiet. Do you want to invite someone else to comment, Lori? Oh, Faye has her hand up. Oh, Faye up. has her hand up. I'm missing the hands in the corners sometimes. Thank you. Um, I have a sister and brother-in-law who are Russian Orthodox. And um, it's, it has been fascinating. It's been a fascinating journey um, as they went through their conversion. He actually was an ordained Episcopal priest and they left the Episcopal church and went to the Russian, the Orthodox church, and he became an ordained priest there. So he's pretty deeply into, um, into his faith. And there, it, it's just been fascinating for me as a lifelong Episcopalian and, you know, not, not real, not was, I wasn't raised real high Episcopal or anything like that. You had to go in and their walls are just covered with icons. And the different, um, I don't know if you noticed the, the woven beads that some of them had, like prayer beads, um, they've got those. And, you know, we've, we've run the gamut from the inside of my sister's van being covered in the little tinkly bells and fringe, and they've gone beyond that. But it, it is a very fascinating and deeply engaging religion. And it's... 
there's there's a lot to be said for the depth of their their faith and their observance. Um, there's a lot to be said for not doing that as well, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's very interesting. Mike, you have your hands raised. Yes, let me first make sure I get my hand down now. I forget <laughs> to do that. Oh, uh, what I appreciate about this particular session in, that we've had so far is the constant attempts by the political elites to control the church, whichever kind of church it is. And I'm sure the same thing goes on in Islam. Don't know about the Jewish religion, Hindu, and so forth, but the power to manipulate people in, in the favor of the ruling elites is just, it's something that Bishop Doyle in particular likes to warn us against. And with that, I will close. Give it to somebody else. Yeah, Paula has a hand raise. Thank you. Um, three things. I just felt it's so ironic we're watching this and the conflict going on in Ukraine. And also their translations were horrible because did you notice <laughs> Bolsheviks and bullshitters? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. yeah. Also, I wanted to mention, and I, I was looking this up on my phone, there's a Cyril and Methodius Catholic Church in Shiner, Texas. Uh, the part of that painted churches tour. Of course, I know they're venerated in different traditions, but I just had never seen that that before. So I just wanted to let you know. That's it. Yeah. Frank wanted to say something. Well, I just say watching this and the attempts of the governments to manipulate people through the church and uh, uh, makes, makes me uh, really appreciate our idea of separation between church and state. I think the people that wrote our Constitution saw a lot of that, and that's why it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Deacon Victoria had her hand raised first. No, uh, Henry um, has had his hand up for quite oh, a while. Henry, oh, I hadn't seen Henry. I saw Victoria and John. I hadn't seen yeah. Henry. Oh, he used a different, he used a different He's icon. clapping. <laughs> oh, he's clapping. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> Yes, Deacon Victoria. Thank you, uh, thank oh. you everybody. Just a quick comment. Um, I have read recently that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, still hopes that um, Moscow will be the future center of uh, Christianity and possibly on a par or replacing Rome. And um, so I thought uh, tonight's uh, program was uh, uh, very good uh, for giving me some background to better understand current events. That's all. Thanks. I'm I'm also thinking about the the um, the context of the invasion of Ukraine, and in seeing how Kiev and all these other places have been in the Ukraine have been so important to the growth and, and place of the Orthodox Church. The other thing too is I remember one uh, report talking about how Kiev was the city of churches, that they have a tremendous number of beautiful churches. Uh, and, you know, so part of the the distress is the damage that's happening to these churches that are so important to the people. And like, like Henry said, it, it's giving a whole, an additional context to what I'm hearing and seeing on the news. Okay, John. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, I mean, First, Mike and Frank's comments both that very resonated with me very strongly. Those things occurred to me too when I was. But I wanted to mention something closer to home, um, like Laurie. Laurie was saying um, 
she and I, when we visited um, our daughter in the Balkans in Macedonia when she was in the Peace Corps, we, we went to get there. We flew to Trieste, which is a city in Italy. And it's right on the Slovenian border and it's right near Austria. And so it's a, it's a city that is a very international city. And it's a city that has a, a, a Austro-Hungarian empire kind of flair to it. And um, uh, we, were walk, we were wandering around in there just, just to sightseeing. And we wandered into the Serbo, Serbian Orthodox Church one morning. And uh, the priest or one of the priests there was singing like morning prayer, I guess. And um, these women were coming in and they were those scarves, you know, like it's sort of those Balkan or Slavic kind of scarves. And they would, they would do all these genuflections, repeated genuflections and cross themselves and cross themselves and kiss these icons. And, and the man, the priest was singing morning prayer and it was so so beautiful i mean we were <laughs> we were like slack john basically with how how uh mysterious you know and uh beautiful and how that conjured up this mystical sort of this mystical atmosphere so i what, what, what Faye was saying we experienced that and uh i had in that instance i thought that yes that uh, that was an example of uh using sort of ancient ritual and a certain atmosphere to really try to conjure up a sense of the holy and the, the serbian orthodox uh, church was able to do that so I just they had the, the history of the slavs on the door too remember yeah. oh ann you had a comment yes um i thought tonight's episode was really wonderful it was so jam-packed with history and politics and so um but but the thing that I really wanted to say was as we move back into receiving communion I sure hope the feeding of the communion with the communal spoon will not be on the books for us so <laughs> that just really got me <laughs> I've never seen that done before but at any rate tonight's episode was really wonderful it's the you know, orthodox was... it's the orthodox approach to, to <laughs> communion and they also use uh leavened bread uh unleavened came only in the western right developed later uh but yeah the they always use uh they, that's when you saw the loaves in one of the other episodes they had the cross and everything on them that's yeah oh deacon victoria yeah i was gonna say uh i was trying to figure out if the people taking the communion had to spit it out into that red scarf i was trying to do they get to keep it or do they have to get rid of it oh that that's just to make sure none of it falls on the floor especially with the yeah. kids or, or older people <laughs> um, but, the, but the other liturgical thing is that there's so there's so much you know that comparison with the uh of Haggai uh Sophia with the Solomon's temple and the if you take a look, you think about it, all the ritual stuff is behind the veil, behind the wall, the icon. The people are not involved in that. As I understand the Eucharistic prayer and all those things are all done behind and then they open the doors out. So I've not been to a service, but that's just my understanding. And, and so there's this interesting thing where all the people are very obviously involved with the with their worship, but they're also separated. And and that is correct. The um, the church that I went to my, with my sister up in <clears throat> Cedar Creek or somewhere up there, um, they did have you were blocked off from the from the actual altar, and then the the priest came out and and distributed the communion. It was off-putting for me. And, and the wide open spaces in Agia Sophia in, in the first, I don't know if you saw that in all the different churches and everything, in the first thousand years, and it's continued in a lot of the churches that are in that tradition, not all of them, but a lot of them. There were some places where older people and uh, people who, you know, weren't very mobile could sit but by and large there were no chairs or benches mm -hmm. or anything it's just wide open space and you do prostrations you stand you kneel you, you do everything uh, out in that space and um 
So that's part of Agia Sophia. And yeah, Mike, you had a comment? Oh, yes. I've been to one Orthodox uh, church service down in Houston. And it was pretty creepy <laughs> to have all the things going on behind closed doors. Now, let's see, there was one other feature of it that I did like, and that is the people stood a lot, which I started doing at St. John Episcopal Church to the chagrin, I'm sure, of those kneeling behind me. But uh, I like standing. Uh, mainly I could see better. But it did feel strange not to see the host elevated and stuff like that there. Like, what are they doing back there? You know, no, it wasn't that, that long ago, Mike, where, um, you know, in Episcopal Church, the priest had his back to the congregation, mm -hmm. and he was kind of like up there, and you didn't necessarily see what's going on. So it wasn't, in a sense, I think it has a parallel there to what you're describing. You know, back in the old days, the Episcopal Church. I remember my yeah. dad, my dad, this old Anglo-Catholic man, boy, it took him a long time to think it was okay to turn around and face the congregation while he was, uh, while he was doing the consecration, what have you. <laughs> I can remember, but... I, I wouldn't want to go back to those days. Is that a carryover from the temple where they had the Holy of Holies, knowing the priest could go in? They would get That's the word what I of was God thinking. They would get the word of God and bring it to the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Minerva, when you think about it, I, I know Mother Minerva has her hand up, but when you think about that, that whole thing, it's like Moses coming down from the mountain and covering his face because he was so full of God. <laughs> what? Yeah. He was so full of what? God. Uh, oh, oh. Okay. The Lord. Yeah. Um, Mother Minerva? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that strike, st struck me about this, and you, a couple of people uh, mentioned it, I think, Scott, you talked about this a little bit, is the role that people have had throughout the, throughout Christianity and how there have always been people who are seen as marginal, who are outside the center, who often are the ones who save the church, right? And all the stories we've heard so far is this little bitty, this missionary went this way and here this all fell down. But because this one little group went up, they were able to, you know, not only did it survive, but it thrived and then it was able to withhold. And so there's these patterns of feeling like the center is where it's all at. And often that becomes the most vulnerable because sometimes it, it, it eats itself up. You know, it, it loses its purpose. It loses its mission. But these small uh, communities, these faithful, you know, whether you call them holy fools or um, hermits or missionaries, that they continue to spread the good news. And it's this, there's something about the gospel, the gospel, not the, the, the church, not the patriarch, not the power, not the, you know, the, the gospel that is just, just grabs you. Um, and I just think it's a, you know, as we think about um, Lent, as we think about our history, how do we constantly remind remind ourselves that it's the spreading of the gospel that's going to help our con our churches continue to um, to survive, w regardless of what changes and what threats come to it? Yeah, thank you. Well, we're up to the end of our time. Um, did anyone have any closing comments? Nobody else's hand is up. I wanted to ask one question okay. as one last thing. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, was, was it my imagination or were people using their left hand for this, to use the sign of the cross? I, I had a Russian student once who told me, and I didn't see that in, in this program, but that they started down here and then went up, so up, or something like that. But I don't think they were doing that, but they were using their left hand, I believe, and so I don't know. So there are a lot of different ways of doing the sign of the cross in, in different traditions. Yeah, and I think some of them were using um, left hand and, and uh, 
yeah, but there there are lots of different um, traditions. I just didn't know if that was purposeful for some symbolic reason or something. You know, no. I've delved into a lot of the things behind it, and people try to create theology out of it. But for instance, even just, uh, you know, I do the, it's a Greek Orthodox manner of, uh, of doing the sign of cross. It's just the way I've gotten used to it. But it, it, that's an old division between East, West, uh, just which side that you go to first and and as i delve back into it historians and everything else you know when the when the priest blesses the congregation some con some people mirrored it and some people use the same side that they did is what the, is the conclusion that people really came to so it, over time it develops meaning but <laughs> but maybe it's because i'm left-handed i noticed that yeah, yeah. but uh, i do use Me i too. do go like this with my right hand so just yeah. look around St. John's on a Sunday morning. See how many different ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I like, I like their to, heart. Something like a little extra thing going on, you know. I take it and go like this boom, because boom. Spanish service. Yeah. I don't know. There's something about that that means yeah. something to me. Very interesting to see that. I'll be able to learn. Everyone's learned different ways in their when they're growing up. You know, it's really interesting. And what you'll find is that people will read meaning and theological meaning into them and everything and develop that over time. But most of the time when I've really tried to delve back into it, it was, you know, reasons like that. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if no one else had any thoughts, Mother Minerva, would you close us in prayer? Yes, I can do that. But one of the things that I would like to ask, is there a question that we have? that we didn't talk, ask, talk about or that you wouldn't want to ask uh, Professor Dan. That would be great because uh -huh. we're, we're gonna, he's going to come um, the last uh, session. And so one of the things he asked is if there were any particular questions or things we would like for him to maybe d uh, dive a little deeper in or curiosity that we, that we could, that, you know, that came up in this Congress in, in our sessions. And I know Henry, you sent something out, and um, but just if so, if you don't have any now, but something comes up, um, send them my way because that will help me prepare uh, and and help uh, Professor Dan prepare as well for when he comes and visits us. All right. Well, um, as has become our, our my custom anyway, is for what and for whom shall we pray? Uh, Ukraine. Amen. And still praying for Afghanistan. My, my Aunt Mary and her family, please. Anyone else or anything else? I would also add the, the people of Russia. Hmm. I would I would ask uh, I, mean, uh, I know personally a couple of Americans. One is the wife of a Marine squadron commander, and the other is um, an infantryman uh, stationed in Poland uh, for their um, um, safety. All right, let us pray. God of mystery and wonder, God of love, we ask you so much today to be with all the people who are struggling and are in violence. For those whose countries are in battle over power, And those who are afflicted by it and who have no control over it. We ask especially for the people of Ukraine, for the people in Russia, and for the people in Afghanistan. But you know, God, that violence and fear are all over your creation. And we ask you to protect us and guide us so that we can turn to love and turn away from violence. We ask for Mary and her family 
as Mary's family's grieving the loss of their loved one, that they remember the resurrection that you have promised to each and every one of us. And for those who are having some surgeries and having uh, medical procedures, especially Edna. And we also ask for those who are serving in our military, especially those who are stationed in Poland and people that Henry knows, because they also are not knowing what tomorrow will bring to them. So may they also be safe and may those people who are in charge of making the decisions of what happens to them, that they may be mindful of the consequences of those choices and decisions. We ask for the people here for their continued curiosity of learning more about the church and learning more about how we can be, live out the mission of the church, which is your mission. And we ask that we can continue to see and hear the opportunities that you may have for us. And during, the, during this Lenten season, that we are particularly attentive to your invitation. We ask all of this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.